Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Robert. Uh, over the last couple of months, I've been doing weekly recommendations from independent booksellers from around the country, but I've decided to change that up a little bit. Uh, sometimes those recommendations are several months after the book comes out. People have already heard about them. Um, and so to try to keep it a little bit more current, what I've decided to try, at least for a month, to see how I like it, is letting you know about some books that are actually coming out right now. So for instance, the books I'm going to tell you about today all come out today. Uh, and I'll try that for about a month and see which I like better, see which you like better, and then go on from there. All right, so I have eight books to get through. Um, I'm going to go through them more quickly than I usually do. Um, and they cover a pretty wide range of genres. So the first one is called Rough Beauty, 40 Seasons of Mountain Living, and it's by Karen Alvinen. In the days after I'd watched my house burn, a great weight lifted, Alvinen writes in this beautiful contemplative memoir. After a fire destroyed Avenin's Colorado Front Range Rocky Mountain home and belongings when she was nearly 40, she moved to an isolated mountain community in the same state. I felt strangely euphoric, she writes, no longer saddled with counting every penny for rent or bills, unburdened by a house full of goods that required care, cleaning, or mending. Mine was the ecstasy of the unencumbered. She watched the seasons unfold with Elvis, her faithful dog, at her side. It's Elvis and her vital relationship with him that's at the core of the book. Elvis had long been my eyes, my ears, but now I realize he was also my guru, my guide. His presence reminded me to play now, sleep now, explore now, be now. Her narrative builds slowly but intensely. Avenin shares rich details of mountain life. Living wild succinctly arranges priorities. You make food, take shelter, stay warm. Her life lived like a ritual, equal to meditation or the ritual I had of writing down weather and birds each morning. This breathtaking memoir honors the wildness of the Rockies and shows readers how they might come to rely on their animal companions. So that's Rough Beauty, 40 Seasons of Mountain Living by Karen Avenon, uh, and it came out from Scribner. And again, these all come out today. The second one is called Social Creature by Tara Isabella Burton. Fans of the cult classic Poison Ivy will appreciate the mousy girl, wide, wild girl dynamic on display in Burton's fiendishly clever debut. At 29, insecure Louise Wilson is a would-be writer living in fear of the dictum, if you haven't made it in New York by 30, you never will. All that changes when she meets 23-year-old socialite Lavinia Williams, who seems to be channeling the free spirit of the late Zelda Fitzgerald with flapper dresses to match. Larger than life, Lavinia takes Louise under her wing and introduces her new bestie to a Manhattan she never knew existed, including parties in haunted hotels and secret bookstores, and people with names like Beowulf Marmont and Athena Maidenhead, all the while dressing as if for a costume ball that never ends. Only later does Louise experience the hateful, spiteful, jealous side of Lavinia's personality. Sorry, the wind just got on my notes. Uh, Louise experiences the hateful, spiteful, jealous side of Lavinia's personality in what becomes an ingenious, dark thriller in the Patricia Highsmith, Tom Ripley mode. Louise and Lavinia are bold, brilliant characters. This devious, satisfying novel perfectly captures a very narrow slice of the Manhattan demimonde. So that's Social Creature by Tara Isabella Burton, and it comes out today from Doubleday. Uh, this next one doesn't have any real interest uh, for me, but it's, it's obviously going to be a big title just because of the names involved, and it's The President is Missing, uh, and it's a joint effort from Bill Clinton and James Patterson. Former President Clinton and bestseller Patterson deliver a page-turning thriller that rivals the best work of such genre titans as Brad Meltzer and Vince Flynn. 
President Jonathan Lincoln Duncan is under fire from the House Select Committee for allegedly ordering a team of special forces and CIA operatives to Algeria to thwart an attempt on the life of Turkish-born terrorist Suleiman Sindaruk, leader of the Sons of Jihad. Hostile committee members repeatedly ask him questions about the raid that he refuses to answer. But Duncan's concerns about the outcome of congressional hearings into his actions are secondary to his fears that a computer virus is about to be activated that would completely cripple the United States. In order to avert the calamity, Duncan leaves the White House and his protective detail behind and attempts to gain the confidence of the shadowy figures who revealed the existence of the threat. The authors keep the suspense high as Duncan dodges bullets from a master assassin deals with his deteriorating health from a blood clotting disorder and strives to unmask a traitor among his inner circle of advisors. Fans of the TV series 24 and the movie Air Force One will be riveted. Um, so that's The President is Missing by Bill Clinton and James Patterson. Sounds to me like every potential thriller cliche you could cram into a single volume. So there you have it. If you like thrillers, let me know if you actually like this one because it really sounds like it could be a problem. Okay, the next one is um, a novel called Kudos by Rachel Cusk. And this is Cusk's final book in her trilogy. The first two titles are Outline and Transit. And this final book expertly concludes the story of protagonist Faye, a British author, as she travels Europe to speak at writers' conferences and give interviews. Since the events of the previous book, Faye has remarried and her sons have grown into teenagers, one of whom is preparing to leave for university to study art history. Yet the novel, like its predecessors, eschews chronicling Faye's life via traditional narrative, instead filling each page with conversations with and monologues by the many writers, journalists, and publicists she meets during her travels. Shifting away from the last book's focus on life's journey, Cusk now places Faye in a series of back and forths on duality in family, art, and representation. In Germany, Faye talks to an interviewer about jealousy. Later, a young tour guide explains his thoughts on education, gender, and rewarding intelligence, and it is here where the novel receives its title. At another stop, Faye is audience to a series of journalists who discuss honestly and workplace excuse me, who discuss honesty and workplace inequality. As always, Cusk's ear for dialogue and language is stunning. The author ends Faye's trilogy with yet another gem. Okay, so that is uh, Kudos by Rachel Cusk, and that came out today from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Or Giroux. I never know how to say that. Okay, the next one is a debut. Uh, it's called Rough Animals by Ray Del Bianco, and it comes out from Arcade today. In Del Bianco's furious and electric debut, a contemporary western, Wyatt and Lucy Smith are twins living a hard scrabble existence on a cattle ranch in Box Elder County, Utah. Early one morning, Wyatt discovers that one of his steers has been fatally shot. The killer is a barely teenaged girl who, during a brief shootout, wounds Wyatt and kills three more of his cattle before escaping. Knowing the entire ranch enterprise has been economically doomed by the shooting, Wyatt decides to go after the girl, who is wounded herself, and demand restitution. With Lucy holding down the fort, Wyatt follows the girl south toward Salt Lake City, tracking her through an inhospitable desert of armed outlaw bikers, camouflaged meth labs, drug deals gone wrong, and hungry coyote packs. Interspersed with Wyatt's narrative are flashbacks to the twins being raised by their father, who schools them in the cruel lessons of nature. Although clearly influenced by the prose styles of Cormac McCarthy and the late Jim Harrison, Del Bianco nevertheless develops her own distinct voice, alternately laconic and roughly poetic. And though the girl is more device than actual character, the novel succeeds as a viscerally evoked and sparely plotted fever dream a bleakly realized odyssey through the American West populated by survivors and failed dreamers. So that's Rough Animals by Ray Del Bianco. 
This next one is one that I'm personally interested in. Uh, I read her previous book, Fates and Furies, and really enjoyed it. And her new collection of short stories is getting a lot of press. And that's Florida by Lauren Groff, which comes out today from Riverhead. Ferocious weather and self-destructive impulses plague the characters in this assured collection, the first from Groff since 2009's Delicate Edible Birds. In the story Above and Below, a grad student loses her university funding and spirals into homelessness. The solo vacationer in the story Salvador, one of three stories set outside Florida, waits out a raging storm with a menacing shopkeeper who, after the harrowing night, smelled of wet denim and sweated out alcohol and sour private skin. Groff's descriptions shimmer with precision. In the story Eye Wall, at the onset of a hurricane that a hallucinating woman endures alone, the lake goosebumped and the house sucked in a shuddery breath. On a family getaway to a cheerless cabin in the claustrophobic story The Midnight Zone, a woman notes how the screams at night pulsed with the tender bellies of lizards. That story is one of five to feature an unnamed fretful mother and novelist who, in the story Eport, has dragged her two son young sons to France while she researches Guy de Massapin. Their world is so full of beauty, she says, fearing for the boy's future, the last terrible flash of beauty before the darkness. Groff's skillful prose, self-awareness, and dark humor leaven the bleakness, making this a consistently rewarding collection. So that is Florida by Lauren Groff. Uh, the next one is a memoir that's also getting quite a bit of, of buzz right now, and that's called Reporter, a memoir by Seymour M. Hirsch. The legendary investigative journalist for the New York Times and the New Yorker recalls his struggles to uncover government secrets and get them printed in this powerful memoir. Hirsch recounts his career unearthing epochal stories from the 1968 massacre of Vietnamese citizens by American troops at My Le and Watergate revelations to abuses at the Abu Ghraib military prison during the Iraq war. There's gripping journalistic intrigue aplenty as he susses out sources and documents, fences with officials, and, and fields death threats. His pursuit of melee perpetrator William Calley, which saw him barking bogus orders at soldiers and crawling through a Fort Benning barracks, feels like a Hollywood thriller. Almost as arduous are his efforts to get nervous editors to run incendiary articles while he navigated Byzantine newsroom politics, especially his testy relationship with Times Chief Abe Rosenthal, who emerges as a hybrid of courage and timidity. Along the way, Hirsch paints pungent sketches of everyone from Henry Kissinger, the man lied the way most people breathed, to the ass-kissing coterie of moronic editors at the Times who watered down a piece on corporate skullduggery. Hirsch himself is brash and direct, but never cynical, and his memoir is as riveting as the great journalistic exposés he produced. So that's Reporter by Seymour Hirsch. This next one launches a new mystery series by a pretty well-known mystery writer. Uh, it's called The Word is Murder by Anthony Horowitz. It comes out today from Harper. This spectacular series launch from bestseller Horowitz, author of Magpie Murders, a scrupulously fair whodunit features a fictionalized version of himself. The author's doppelganger, who, like his creator, has written a Sherlock Holmes pastiche, The House of Silk, and a Tin Tin movie script for Steven Spielberg, is approached by Daniel Hawthorne, a former detective inspector who once consulted on one of his TV series. Hawthorne wants Horowitz to turn his real-life cases into books and eventually gets him to agree. Their first joint investigative venture concerns the strangulation of Diana Cowper in her London home, mere hours after she visited a funeral partner at parlor and made detailed arrangements for her own funeral. In one amusing metafictional scene, Hawthorne criticizes Horowitz for inaccuracies in Chapter 1, an omniscient third-person account of the funeral home visit. 
An interrupted text Diana sent to her son shortly before her death leads the duo to look into a long-ago hit-and-run tragedy that claimed one twin child's life and seriously injured the other. Deduction and wit are well-balanced, and fans of Peter Lovesey and other modern channelers of the spirit of the golden age of detection will clamor for more. So that is the start of a new series, called the, and it's called The Word is Murder by Anthony Horowitz. This next one is a novel, and it is also um, one of the ones that the independent booksellers are pushing in the month of June, and it's called There There by Tommy Orange, and it comes out today from Knopf. Orange's commanding debut chronicles contemporary Native Americans in Oakland as their lives collide in the days leading up to the city's inaugural Big Oakland powwow. Bouncing between voices and points of view, Orange introduces 12 characters, their plot lines hinging on things like 3D printed handguns and VR controlled drones. Tony Loneman and Octavio Gomez see the powwow as an opportunity, opportunity to pay off drug debts via a brazen robbery. Others like Edwin Black and Orville Redfeather view the gathering as a way to connect with ancestry and in Edwin's case, to meet his father for the first time. Blue, who was given up for adoption, travels to Oklahoma in an attempt to learn about her family, only to return to Oakland as the powwow's coordinator. Orville's grandmother, Jackie, who abandoned her family years earlier, reappears in the city with powwow MC Harvey, whom she briefly dated when the duo lived on Alcatraz Island as adolescents. Time and again, the city is a magnet for these individuals. The propulsion of both the overall narrative and its players are breathtaking as Orange unpacks how decisions of the past mold the present, resulting in a haunting and gripping story. So that's There There by Tommy Orange. And that one sounds really fascinating to me. I, of course, am going to wait for the paperback. I've decided I'm, I'm done with buying hardbacks. This next one is, if you're looking for something, um, I don't want to call it light and fluffy and, that, and to sound like that's being pejorative, but it just it seems like more of a fun read than anything else. And it's How Hard Can It Be by Allison Pearson. It comes out today from St. Martin's. The winning follow-up to Pearson's best-selling I Don't Know How She Does It is anchored by heroine Kate Reddy's authentic, intelligent, and consistently funny British voice. When Kate's architect husband is laid off and begins training as a therapist, the 49-year-old stay-at-home mother of two tries to return to the workforce. After a disastrous job interview confirms she has aged out of her field, she was formerly a jet-setting power player at an influential London brokerage firm, Kate starts lying about her age and is hired to market the very hedge fund she created years ago. Meanwhile, her daughter just texted a Belfie, a selfie of your bum, to a friend who posted it on Facebook. Her son won't look up from his phone, and she hasn't had sex with her husband in months. Further muddying the waters is a man from her past who reasserts himself in her life just as her marriage stagnates. Pearson maintains a humorous tone throughout resting laughs from her lead's lowest moments and greatest triumphs. Pearson also hits the right notes in conveying the cluelessness and powerlessness parents feel raising teens obsessed by gaming and social media. Readers will cheer on Kate as she becomes a kick-butt woman of a certain age. So that is How Hard Can It Be? The follow-up to I Don't Know How She Does It uh, by Allison Pearson. The next book is a biography, and I think it's one that uh, Steve Donahue mentioned on his channel a week or two ago, uh, but it comes out today. It's Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Pauly, and it's out from Simon & Schuster today. This thorough, well-sourced biography from Pauly, the author of Tapped Out, is an engrossing examination of the life of a martial arts movie star and his shocking early death. Lee was born in San Francisco in 1940, but his family moved to Hong Kong shortly after his birth. He started acting there as a child, and at age 16 began studying under Kung Fu master Ip Man. 
In 1959, Lee moved to Seattle in pursuit of a career acting and teaching kung fu. He landed a few roles in American television series such as The Green Hornet, but eager for better roles, he moved back to Hong Kong, where he starred in such action movies as Fist of Fury and The Way of the Dragon. Pauly describes Lee as a patron of kung fu who sought to straddle east and west, yet routinely faced racism. For example, relatives of his wife Linda refused to attend their wedding in 1964. He possessed a volatile temper, a dangerously obsessive work ethic, and a propensity for extramarital affairs. In 1973, Lee collapsed and died while dubbing dialogue for Enter the Dragon, and Polly is especially strong as he sifts through the sensational aftermath of Lee's death, rejecting tabloid rumors that he died in an actual fight and outdated medical opinions of death by cannabis intoxication in favor of the more logical cause, heat stroke, given Hong Kong's heat wave that very day. In what is certainly the definitive biography of Lee, Polly wonderfully profiles the man who constructed a new masculine Asian archetype and ushered Kung Fu into pop culture. So there you have it, a, a new biography of Bruce Lee by Matthew Polly. And our last uh, title today is a short story collection um, called Sweet and Low um, by Nick White, and it comes out today from Blue Rider. White's brilliant first story collection, following the novel How to Survive a Summer, peels back the curtain on masculinity and identity in the Deep South. The stories are split into two parts. The first features misfits reeling from death, disillusionment, and trauma, while the second captures angles of aspiring writer Forney Culpepper's life. Each illuminates sympathetic characters who feel painfully out of place, throwing the strangeness of their circumstances into sharp relief. In Gatlinburg, I want to say that that's probably Gatlinburg and that this is a misprint, a couple's vacation in the Smoky Mountains is shadowed by the threat of a bear wandering the area, plus something more sinister, which exposes the relationship's fault lines. Lady Tigers finds high school-aged Rusty serving as bus driver for a girls' softball team, formerly coached by his deceased father, until an accident reveals secrets linking him to one of the players. And in the title story, a young Forney watches his mother pursue a long-dreamed-of singing career with irritation until her performance at a cigarette-smoke-choked club opens his eyes to her in a novel and terrifying way. White's stirring stories probe the inextricable ways people's identities are bound to and shaped by their environments and what happens when they attempt to rise above. This is an atmospheric and expertly crafted collection. So that's Sweet and Low by Nick White. Okay, so there you have it. The, the new release is coming out today. Um, if you're planning on reading any of them, let me know. And if you do actually read any of them, please drop me a note and let me know what you thought of it. Uh, of those, the ones that probably interest me the most are the Seymour Hersh memoir. Um, I'm also interested in, in Lauren Groff's new collection, Florida. And also, um, oh, I just went blank on the, on the other one. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. Oh, the one There There by Tommy Orange is the other one that I'm interested in. So, there you have it. I'll be back tomorrow probably with a tag video. And then on Friday, I'll do my Friday reads. If you're following along the read-alongs, this week we're reading uh, Anthony Powell's A Question of Upbringing, which is the first volume in his 12-volume series called A Dance to the Music of Time. Um, and I'll be back on Sunday with the video for that. Okay, I hope you have a great remaining whatever's left of this week. Have a great week. Uh, I'm going to go enjoy this gorgeous weather while it's not too hot, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.